And thank you for joining us. A pleasure to be here today. We are back from uh, different time zones. So if I seem out of it today, I apologize for that. <laughs> we have a couple of great guests today. We are also live on Clubhouse as well to take your calls there. I see I see the hands that are up, but I'm warning you, I'm going to be chatting. I've got such great guests. I'm going to be chatting with them for quite a while here. First up, we have Rob Henderson. He is a... Uh, frequent flyer on this show, I would say. He's a doctoral candidate at Cambridge, studies social and evolutionary psychology, got a BS from Yale, and he's a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. He has an interesting uh, life experience. I'll have him give you an abbreviated sort of rendition of that. He's also been writing for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Psychology Today, and most recently interviewed by Jordan Peterson. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome to Bob Henderson. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Great to be here. And by the way, it wasn't just it wasn't just interviewed by uh, Jordan Peterson. It was um, lavished with praise by Jordan Peterson, who's, who's not someone who uh, who uh, uh, you know is is uh, free with that kind of thing. And, and I was so I was laughing to myself even when he praised you. He was like, "I'm not don't don't t- don't don't let this inflate your ego. I'm just observing the truth. It's <laughs> just a matter of fact here. Yeah. You're just a good graduate student. That was uh, it was really funny. <laughs> that was a very yeah. It, it was a, I mean, it was a very, um, you know, kind comment, uh, compliment from him. But then, you know, he sort of backtracked and said, it's not a compliment. It's just an observation. You know, this is very, uh, you know, you have a sharp <laughs> mind. This is a great conversation. And I agreed, uh, you know, I, I, I would, that it was a good conversation. Not necessarily to have a sharp mind. Uh, no, he's but, right. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, and, and let, let was, me say, uh, let yeah, me that, say that was, it. You know, fun, fun times. I'm going to say it in a more uh, sort of uh, uh, holistic way. And again, my brain is not working perfectly today. I would just say the combination of your life experience and your training and your innate and intellectual abilities come together to provide important insights and observations. That's how I think of it. And tell people, if you don't mind, yeah, just that. give us a little sketch you know, of your of your history as a ne'er-do-well. <laughs> If you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, just very briefly. I mean, yeah, now I'm, you know, studying psychology at Cambridge, but, you know, before this, my life was a lot different. I, you know, I was born uh, to poverty. My, my mother was an immigrant from South Korea. She got hooked on drugs when I was a little kid. I spent uh, a few years living around foster homes in Los Angeles, um, lived in seven different homes before being adopted by a working class family in Northern California. Uh, but there was a divorce and remarriage and just a lot of family drama, uh, even after I had been adopted and a lot of just, you know, my, my adoptive father, uh, subsequently after he had divorced my adoptive mother, severed ties with me. I just went through a lot of chaos as a, as a little kid and got into a lot of trouble as a consequence, never paid attention in school, barely graduated high school. And it, I didn't really get my life together till after I enlisted in the military and started to think more about what I wanted to do with my future. But yeah, there was a there was a period there where um, yeah I, I was not taking school seriously at all and uh, just got in a lot of trouble with my friends. Now speaking of trouble with your friends, the the one thing that you've been I've seen I, I feel like it's been on your mind lately. I read I read your emails every day. And by the way, how can people sign up for that? Yeah, you can just go to my website, robkhenderson.com. I put out a weekly newsletter on Sundays. Occasionally, I'll do one in the middle of the week, but the Sunday one is the one that I, I keep out consistently where I write about observations on human nature, uh, observations and and sort of uh, my discussions of various psychological studies and sociological studies, history, as well as sort of stories from my personal life. And it, it's sort of eccentric and eclectic, but uh, people seem to be responding and, and seem to like it. They're important observations, but I, I, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but I feel like what's been on your mind a bit lately is what, now that you have a deeper understanding of the human experience, sort of your experience with your peers at Yale and what's going on in these Ivy League campuses seems to be standing out for you a bit these days. Am I, am I right about that? 
it's it's really been on my mind ever since I set foot uh, as an undergrad at Yale uh, in 2015. Just um, you know, I, I, I had been discharged from the military in August of 2015, uh, and in September I started my first semester, fall term, uh, at Yale as an undergrad, going there on the GI Bill, a little older than some of the students, and com- you know, came from a very different life background. I mean, there was a study in the New York Times a couple of years ago showing that. There are more students at Yale from the top 1% than there are from the bottom 60% uh, in terms of income for, for American families. So uh, that was just a, a completely uh, just uh, unexpected experience culturally. I sort of knew, of course, like the students here are going to be sort of uh, economically affluent, but culturally it was quite a shock for me. And so that's always on my mind. It's something that I, I write a lot about. and why I coined that term luxury beliefs, which uh, Jordan and I talked a lot about on his podcast. Give, give a sketch of that. I, I, in other words, the, the way I simplistically understand it essentially is that if you're not busy trying to survive, there are other ways that you can ac- acquire power and status. Yeah, that's uh, definitely. So, so, so luxury beliefs, I conceptualize this idea based on what I'd seen at Yale, along with a lot of the, the research that I'd done on sort of this old school sociology for Lynn and Pierre Bourdieu, basically indicating that, you know, in the past, upper class people displayed their status with their material goods, sort of what they wore. And today I, I suggest that now people aren't really indicating their status. Highly educated and affluent people don't indicate their status quite as much with their luxury goods. And now they're doing it with, uh, with luxury beliefs. And these are sort of unusual ideas and opinions that they often absorb from elite universities or through the media, uh, sort of uh, pub- publications and periodicals and podcasts and so on and all these things. And this sort of distinguishes them from uh, sort of the masses, from conventional thought. And we can get into specifics if you want. But uh, for the, lo- you know, some people have pushed back on this idea. They say, you know, actually people, you know, people still uh, favor luxury goods. People still dress them differently based on their economic level or whatever. But I made this observation recently that uh, I, I'd, I'd recently uh, flown uh, to California and, and recently got back. And I walked through first class and I noticed that the people in first class dressed exactly the same as the people in coach. You wouldn't be able to tell just by what the passengers were wearing, who was uh, a member of first class and who was sort of sitting in coach. And to me, this is sort of this indicator that, um, yeah, the class divides are not always so apparent by how people dress, but the upper class still has this a uh, desire to elevate themselves. And so now they do it through their ideas and opinions. Well, I mean, just look at Mark Zuckerberg, right? I mean, that guy never wears a coat or a tie or anything ever, right? And and I, and, right. and you've heard, I, I know you listen to Adam and Drew Pod occasionally, and, and uh, you hear Adam talk about this all the time. He and I sort of have talked about how when we were growing up, you know, you'd walk onto an airplane and there would be Don Draper in a tie and blazer, maybe with a hat, and uh, the you know the young the young parent would say to their kid Joey and he, one day you could be like Mr. Draper you just work hard stay with it and you know this this could be yours now people walk by and go what they, and they go assholes what are these assholes up here at first they think they're better Psh, fuck them it's sort of now now there so so there's actually liability in standing out now it mm-hmm. seems to me you know what's funny so when i was on that that same flight when i made that observation about first class and coach uh during you know it's a long flight to california it's 11 hours from you know london to, to san francisco i watched an episode of curb your enthusiasm and in the episode uh one of larry david's friends buys like a maserati or something and larry's telling him are you nuts you shouldn't drive a maserati around here people are going to get angry at you they're going to try to rob you you shouldn't be driving that nice car around here uh, and, and, you know, Larry's yeah. driving like a Prius or something like that. And, and of course, like Larry and all of his friends are multi multi millionaires, but they still are like downplaying, yeah. they're dressing it down, driving very normal right. cars because they don't That's want right. to attract that resentment. That's right. Exactly right. And, and and that's fine. I, I mean, if they really want to take it all the way, they should be doing things with that money to really, you know, sort of contribute in ways that, you know, maybe, I, I, you know, I don't want to tell them how to spend their money. But in fact, there's another sort of uh, thing I was thinking about today I'm going to bring up right now that I brought up with Megyn Kelly yesterday, which was, I, I find it so bizarre right now. One of the most bizarre trends we are into is people telling other people how to live their life. And, and just a, such a bizarre impulse to me. I, I, can't, I can't even get my head around it. 
And when people used to accuse me of that, of somehow being a, a, a buzz kill because I help people with addiction, stop doing drugs. If people want to do drugs and drink, ha have at it. I have no problem with that at all. If you get a disorder where you can't stop, I can help you. That's all. That's my thing. But I would never tell somebody how to live. In fact, it's considered anathema in mental health to tell people what to do with their relationships, to tell people what to do with their lives. That, that's considered unethical. And to me, the most glaring example of this meddlesome, weird, I'm going to tell you how to live your life. To me, the, the, the poster child experience for that was Joe Rogan and his doctor. Joe Rosen and his doctor set up a treatment plan for Joe. It worked. No one should have any goddamn opinion about that except Joe and maybe the doctor when he assesses what he does. Or maybe the doctor's professional societies. People don't even understand. The FDA, the NIH, the all, all those organizations that have been in the press now have nothing to do with the practice of medicine. And if you saw Scott Gottlieb recently, he really did a long interview where he brought that up. He said, see, he's not set up for this. This isn't how we... This isn't, what happens when a patient and a doctor is nobody's business. Literally nobody's. The The CDC just gives us morbidity and mortality reports and publications and some advice and some, you know, th that's all they're set up to do. They don't practice medicine. The FDA doesn't practice medicine. The FDA gives guidelines for what products can be brought to market. They don't tell doctors what to do with it. That's up to the doctor and the mm -hmm. patient, strictly, exclusively. So this idea that people are going to tell other people how to live their lives. I, I just, that's the most bizarre thing in the world for me. And, and it, and I guess it kind of used to come from the right under the rubric of a religious thing. You need to be saved. Now yeah. it's coming from the left. It has the same kind of religious energy, but I don't understand what they're saving people from. Yeah. Well, I, I think like just from like a sort of sociological psychological perspective, I mean, one reason, I, I guess there are two two reasons that I can think of off the top why people would want to do that. One would be um, because they think that people who live different lifestyles than themselves, it's sort of a, an implicit judgment on the way that they live their own lives. Uh, and so if you're doing something different well, so it's for a me, projection. then I'm thinking, well, well it's sort it's of like, projection. okay, well, I'm, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and you're doing this other thing. And so this is sort of upsetting me because by you doing something else, it, it sort of implicitly is telling me that what I'm doing is wrong. So I have to tell you that you're wrong so that I can be right, right? One of us has to be right here. And if you're doing something right, different yeah. than me, then I have to tell you, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. But I think a, a lot of but what you're we're talking about now something, with, hey, But social, Rob, yeah. I, I want to interrupt you. I interrupt you before you say it. You're talking yeah. about shame. That shame is what motivates mm -hmm. those kinds of experiences where you've, you're exposed to feeling bad about what you're doing. I'm bad for my choices. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I have to make you bad. Shame is alive and well yeah. in this country, trust me. So to to make it about shame, and again, shame is the is the is the sort of uh, um, aftermath of trauma, right? So shame is always there mm -hmm. after trauma. So that makes some some sense to me. I'm sorry, I interrupted you though. Go ahead. Well, no, no. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. The the other piece of that, and and, and I guess this is uh, there, there may be a more strategic component to this for many people. Uh, especially in the age of social media, where anyone can get their thoughts out there and and you know get it in front of thousands of people, which is the sort of signaling mechanism, where if I can broadcast and very clearly say, you know, you made this treatment plan with your doctor and that's wrong for X, Y, and Z reasons, and I'm posting it online or I'm I'm saying it out loud, knowing that many people can hear me, I'm sort of like reminding everyone else and and sending a signal to my sort of political or ideological compatriots out there. Like, I'm still one of you. It can get, get me likes. It can get me status, get me whatever retweets and, yeah, and comments and so on. Yeah. And that can feel really good too. So I may not even care what Joe Rogan yeah. says, but if I can say Joe Rogan is a bad guy and get a thousand likes, then I'll go ahead and say that. That's interesting. It's sort of, it's sort of very primitive and, and sort of disgusting, frankly. I mean, it's sort of that people are going to that level, but it makes sense. Um, I read an interesting discussion of tribalism i don't think it was on it might have been on your your uh, your uh, email which was that psychopathy is treating somebody in your in group like somebody in the your out group think about that oh yeah they were making the point they were making the point that's that when we when we we are we lose so much of our humanity in identifying out groups we aggress against them we shame them. We have no empathy for them. That's how psychopaths navigate through everybody. But uh, so, yeah. so an interesting construct is a psychopath is 
someone who treats his or her in-group the way somebody else, a normal person, treats an out-group. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I had tweeted that because it was something that I had heard. I couldn't remember the specific psychologist who said that. But the observation here, I was sort of riffing off of this this brief article from David Sloan Wilson, who's an evolutionary psychologist. I believe he's an evolutionary psychologist. But he was basically writing that all of us have the capacity for psychopathy, uh, depending on the circumstance and who we're interacting with. And he made some comments about sort of uh, our evolutionary past. And there have been, I can't remember the anthropologist's name, but it was something like... Uh, for the for the vast period of human history, humanity ended at the border of the tribe. And so, you know, there's there's you mm. and your group of right. 100, 150 people. And outside of that, those are not actually humans to you. Those are outsiders there. I mean, in some languages um, uh, today, to this day, uh, among like modern hunter gatherer tribes, the word human actually only applies to those within their uh, coalition. And outside of that, they use a different term. For those who are not in the coalition, a, a word that doesn't mean human, it means animal or it means something else. And that's actually sort of what, what we naturally think. That's sort of the how we naturally respond to people who are sort of outside of our circle or outside of our groups. And it's taken a long time. I mean, I know that you're a student of, of history and of the Enlightenment and philosophy. And all through that period of the Enlightenment, we sort of learned to expand our moral circle and, and think of, uh, you know, other people as, as human beings and that, uh, that took a lot of work for us to get to that point. And I sometimes worry with social media mm -hmm. and a lot of the toxicity we're seeing now that we're sort of reverting back to that old sort of primitive coalitionary mindset. Wow. Do you think that's probable? I mean, it's, 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 I think we're actually already seeing it. Uh, but fortunately, it's on this sort of like digital media where there's no one actually physically being hurt or attacked or, or you know, not, not very often. Fortunately, and it's it's mostly just um, sort of slinging mud through Twitter or mm. Facebook or these sort of online platforms. I hope it doesn't leave this sort of digital medium. And you know, if we're going to enact these sort of uh, tribal impulses, these sort of old school, sort of primitive uh, behaviors, it, that it'll it's just mob. stay online. You're talking, you, you, you're talking about mob, which which is really what the founding fathers were afraid of. Uh, the French kind of were afraid of it. But, but mobs have always been something to be avoided. They've been something that has to be managed because it is irrational, it is tribal, it is not productive, and yet we are encouraging it today, which is wild. Um, is evolutionary psychology under attack? I mean, I, I, I used to like to read David Buss, and all of a sudden he was the worst person in the world. <laughs> and uh, how, how, does it, how does it, you know David Buss is? Yeah, well, he was under attack. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because he dared to say, he dared to say that there were biological differences and that they evolved through time. Uh, and so to, to take a position on that is considered anathema today. But but do you feel attacked as an evolutionary psychologist? Again, the, the, I will tell you, uh, let me just give you the, the, usual, the usual criticism of evolutionary psychology is you can't do RCTs, you can't do randomized controlled study, really. Everything are just so stories. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've heard those criticisms before, and and to to, to some degree they still exist. But I think by now uh, the the discussion is maybe less contentious. David Buss doesn't seem to be under so much, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be a target so much these days. He recently wrote a great book called Men Behaving Badly, uh, which I reviewed for Quillette. I did like a three thousand word review for for Quillette, which is really, I mean, that book was fascinating. Uh, basically, going. Uh, in depth on male and female sexual psychology and sort of, you know, the circumstances in which men commit sort of heinous acts and sort of going into dark triad personality constructs and what type of males tend to tend to behave badly, uh, in particular towards towards women and, and, you know, in, in those sort of uh, toxic, toxic circumstances and toxic males and so on. And uh, I think evolutionary psychology in general is in a pretty good position. Um, I know that it has its detractors okay. and, and critics and so on, but, but by and large, I think I, I, uh, it, it helps you know, sort of doing I, I, well. You know, I, evolutionary biology has been under attack for God's sakes. And, and I was trained as a biologist and the foundation of biology was evolutionary processes. That, that's how you understood biology. You didn't understand it any other way. You can't understand it any other way. But anyway, uh, we'll get to the dark triad too in just a second. But I want to go, circle back to something you said about, uh, you know, we were talking about how people dress down and don't wear, fan, uh, don't um, um, drive fancy cars, things like that. I, we just got back from France. And so I'm a little preoccupied about the French right now. 
And one of the things that um, I've learned from French friends is that the French, and, and I was reading about this before I went over there too, they have luxury brands over in France as sort of historical anachronisms. You notice how they don't have luxury cars in France, right? The reason they don't have luxury cars is they generally disdain luxury and money generally. Money, you know, it sort of accumulation of money and expression with luxury. Luxury. The luxury brands are sort of seen, you know, sort of artistic anachronisms of their history. Uh, and, but no cars, no new bill, you know, none of that. Um, and my friends or friends explained to me that in France, you don't get status through having money. In fact, it's disdainful. You get money, you get status, I beg your pardon, not through luxury ideas, but through intellectual prowess that you put on display, particularly through the use of the French language on a regular basis. Is that interesting? Interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I would, I would be curious to know what those intellectual markers are exactly. Uh, you know, uh, of course, I'm, I'm slightly biased, but I could imagine that many of those the intellectual prowess that they're demonstrating would be sort of unusual ideas or or certain critiques of society it, that it, do it's, confer it's status not. on it, them. It, while, it, it, while, it can be. Yeah. Well, well, let yeah. me let me let me take it even further because I know I know them pretty well. I, I'm sort of proud of myself for getting my head around them. And and what I can tell you from your point of view, the reason you go that way is you've never had a French teacher. <laughs> Because if you had a French okay. teacher, you would kind of understand how they peacock their intellect. And a lot of it is mm. through the use of the language. They have the Académie Française. They have an academy okay. that's evaluating language every day in the, in the country of France. Are you all keeping up to the standards of what this great language is supposed to be? So language is where it starts. Uh. And then it literally, it literally gets into all sorts of intellectual ideas. Philosophy, of course, think about the French has been a very important thing for them. Now, okay. they are bewildered. They are bewildered how Americans could be hung up on French philosophers from 70 years ago, the post-structuralists, Saussure, uh, Foucault, all those guys, yeah, who have been considered completely irrelevant by the French. Like, dumb ideas, sidelines, no longer relevant. And somehow, we are, pre we are preoccupied with that here in this country. <laughs> That's the, that's their current sort of insight into America. And, and of course, they they value pushing intellectual material forward. They really do. Since Napoleon, that's sort of been the thing. Well, we should adopt I mean, some think of about, those, think about the, think about the arrogance. Here, then. Hmm. I, I think about the intellectual arrogance. They changed the calendar. They invented the metric system. <laughs> I mean, this was what happened post-revolutionary France. They they. they, they the Curies came along. I, I mean, they just, they decided everything was oh, yeah. new and different, but they put it in a scientific context and an intellectual context. And, uh, you know, it, when I was in medical school, essentially every neurological disorder, if you didn't know what the name was, you would just say it's named after a, a German, excuse me, named after a French neurologist at the turn of the 20th century. And you'd never be wrong. Charcot, Babinski, whatever, whoever it is, it was the, they were just dominated on the intellectual pursuits. Of course, there there were other countries, of course, Austria and whatnot too. But but it's just got to. I just have my head in their space these days because I just spent some time with them, and uh, it's it's very interesting that here, the more bizarre, the more sort of uh, detached from reality, the ideas, and, and the more inflammatory. That's sort of where we're at with it. Yeah, that's. I mean, I I just read this uh, this interesting article. It was in the Spectator, uh, originally published a few years ago, uh, making this point that, um, and you can maybe correct me on some of this, but what I understand is that in France, in order to get into their top universities, uh, Sciences Po and some of those those great places, you have to score very high on these rigorous exams yeah. on these. I think they're standardized tests. Yeah. Whereas if you want to get into they're, an elite they're, school in the they're, US, they're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're crazy. To, now yeah, now yeah, we've gotten rid of the they, tests. They seem, we, well, yeah, we we have this movement towards getting rid of them. I mean, although the the elite schools, many of them at least, still have the uh, the standardized tests, the SATs and the ACTs, um, but they're not quite as strict about the cutoff scores about who can get in. And you know, it's much. It's at least uh, as much to do with your sort of social presentation, your grades, which can be to some degree uh, engineered and and manipulated. 
your extracurriculars, your sort of academic resume, all these other things can can sort of bolster your application right. to get into a place like you know Harvard or Princeton or something. Whereas there, it's much more about yeah. like you know, can you meet this very rigorous standard on this test? Um, and so I wonder if that sort of selects for a certain of elite in France, whereas in America, our elites are selected in a more maybe hodgepodge kind of way, uh, where people who can sort of uh, present themselves in a certain way are able to to, to enter the top universities. So yeah, and and, and I it's think called, yeah, called, I mean the, yeah. the elites here are it's, it's called the, ba- the Bach. They call it the Bach, mm. the Bach, the Baccalaureate, the but, the Bach. You have to pass the Bach. You have to get prepare for the Bach. Uh, okay. BAC Bach. <laughs> And, and, it's, okay. and it's insane. And the kids spend a year mm. killing themselves getting ready for that thing. But it, it's like the bar yeah. kind of thing in law, law school, too. It's mm. uh, so we're going to talk about the dark triad in a second. Before I go there, though, I noticed you either retweeted or put something on Facebook or something about something I said about what something the CDC said. And they since I can't find it now. They seem to have taken it down, which is oh, no. that their position was, yeah. Their position was that the long-term solution and the achievement of so-called herd immunity is going to be arrived at by as many people as possible getting vaccinated and then those people getting infected. So it's a, a mild illness, which, which are the majority of cases that have been vaccinated. Not everybody, I understand, but they, are, they, want, they want vaccine plus natural immunity in order to achieve uh, ultimate herd immunity was what the position they had. And it made, made sense. They just can't, they just won't say it publicly. Yeah. I heard you talking about that with, with Adam on the, uh, Adam and Dr. Drew show. And yeah, that was, that was mm-hmm. fascinating to me because I'd actually, I remembered reading something similar to that in the new Republic. Uh, this journalist interviewed a bunch of medical doctors and, and medical researchers, and they, they sort of came to that same conclusion yep. of like, this is going to be with yeah. us for a few years. The goal is to get as many people vaccinated to minimize the symptoms. But in the long term, you know, most yeah. of the population, if not everyone, is going to end up getting this thing. And it just sort of came yeah. and went. That that That's right. Republic article was about a month ago, and no one paid attention to it. And then your conversation yeah, that, reminded that's me a, of that's it. That's a yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and it's true. Uh, and and it, if we really I think Great Britain, where you are, has sort of come to terms with that. That's sort of how they're proceeding. And many countries are proceeding yeah. that way. They're just getting them all vaccinated as much as you can. I don't know if maybe the vaccine hesitancy has been more severe than people thought, so they don't feel like they can really advocate that sort of policy. I, I don't know. It, it's, mm. it's interesting to see how this plays out. I do think that's what we're going to have to do. I, I just don't see another way of really getting this thing fully suppressed. Uh, but you yeah. know, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we do need antivirals. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I was thinking, you know, there there are three antivirals coming. I knew of two. Now I know of three, and they look really good. And that will be another layer of being able to protect people when they get the natural infection. In other words, you can be vaccinated, and you can take the uh, the antiviral as soon as you get sick, and this thing is not going to be a big deal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's welcome news. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, so, so over trial. here, what I'm, yeah. Oh, go ahead and finish your thought. And then you're going to talk about the dark. Well, trial, I, I, I'm thinking about that these days. Well, yeah, we can get into the dark. Trial. I was just going to point out that, you know, I, I've noticed here that, that people are, are just generally more relaxed about, about the vaccine, about the lockdowns, about everything here. And in America, it seems much more, much more polarized. And yeah, I'm hoping that things will, will, will cool down once these, maybe these antivirals come out or, or sort of once people just sort of, learn over time that, that this is going to be something that's with us for a while, as you were saying. Well, it, it's interesting to me that the masking is to me the most interesting um, sort of example of, of uh, d- people's d- display of their feelings. In France, they were all mm. very apologetic. In Greece, they barely have enforced it. You know, there's just sort of, yeah, we'd like you to mask, please mask. And and, and I started talking, mm. I factors on the Adam and Drew podcast, I started talking about the research, the randomized controlled trials on masks, and the research shows that there's somewhere between 9% and 15% effective. Like they'll reduce case mm-hmm. rates by that much. Not zero. They're not zero. They're not not in fact mm-hmm. effective. They're just marginally effective. And when you're talking about large, large numbers of people, you, you may want to advocate for that. That makes sense to me. But to pretend that yeah. it's 80% effective or 100% effective and, and, and to signal that if you're not doing it, it's, you're killing somebody – we we have to get away from that. I, I'm really troubled by that. 
Yeah. Yeah. There does seem to be this sort of signaling, like a social signaling component to it. Um, what I noticed when I was in California recently is, so my mother lives in San Jose, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, sort of very sort of blue area of California. And there people were still wearing masks inside and outside. Um, you know, just, just masks everywhere. I saw people driving alone in their cars, no one in the car with them, windows rolled up, they were wearing a mask. And then I traveled uh, about four that, that hours. That has nothing north to do with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, that, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I traveled about four hours north where my sister lives uh, in, in a town called Reading, which is a sort of more working class, blue collar town. And there, nobody was wearing masks. No, uh, you know, we went to the mall, we went to restaurants. I saw zero people wearing masks inside or outside. So it was interesting. In San Jose, everyone wore masks even outside. And then in Reading, this sort of more working class part of California, no one wore masks even inside. And I was asking my sister, you know, when did people stop wearing masks around here? And she said, oh, they never started. Uh, masks were never worn. And, and she was telling me that a lot of businesses had never shut down during the lockdown. Um, it, there are wide swaths of California. People don't know this, like in central California, northern California that are just kind of off the grid. No one knows about these places. And they were ignoring a lot of the mask mandates and lockdown mandates basically from the beginning, uh, which was, which is kind of surprising to me as she was explaining this. Um, so even within the same state, uh, there's this vast difference in how people are responding to this based on, I think to some degree, based on education level, sort of occupation, white collar versus blue collar and so on sort of class related um, uh, California is like at least four different states, maybe five. And, and you went <laughs> yeah. from Northern California to far Northern California, each two different, very different states, which are different than central California, oh, yeah. which are different than parts of Southern California. It's all very, very different. It's really weird. I, I don't know this state can hold yeah. together. Um, <laughs> So uh, let's get to the dark triad. What, what are you thinking about that these days? We've talked a little about it in the past. Is it, it's, is it becoming more common? Do we have a public health dark triad health crisis? <laughs> What's happening here? That's something, uh, I mean, the public health, I, I think there is something going on with this, with this personality construct. So very briefly, the dark triad is a constellation of three personality traits uh, studied by social and evolutionary psychologists. Uh, and it encompasses narcissism, which most people are familiar with, is sort of uh, entitled self-importance, and uh, psychopathy, which is um, this sort of callousness and this cynicism, disregard for other people, and Machiavellianism, which is uh, associated with sort of uh, uh, strategic duplicity and manipulativeness. And these three constructs, although they're sort of they're they're all different, they tend to um, be correlated with one another. So if you score high on one, oftentimes you'll score high on on the others. Um, what I find interesting about this uh, is that, so, so I was curious, so what gives rise to these personality constructs? You know, why would someone score highly on any of these? They seem to be uh, not always so adaptive and can hinder relationships and you know, basically make someone unpleasant to be around. Why would, why would these personality traits arise? So, of course, like to some degree, it's due to gen genetics, but there does seem to be an environmental factor here. Um, so the study, I, I don't recall, the, I think it was uh, Peter Jonasson might have been the first author on this. It was a 2016 study finding that, you know, they, they were at a couple of different things uh, and related to development in childhood. What happens in childhood that might give rise to the dark triad in adulthood? Uh, they looked at uh, childhood socioeconomic circumstances. Could poverty sort of give rise to these personality traits? And they looked at uh, instability, childhood unpredictability or instability. Um, and to see whether these two things might might be associated with the dark triad in adulthood, harmful behaviors in adulthood. And what they find is that economic circumstances in childhood are not associated at all with the dark triad. It doesn't really matter how poor you are as a kid. Um, that's not really related to whether you'll develop these um, sort of unpleasant traits in adulthood. But what is associated is childhood instability. And the scale they used asked people questions like, you know, when you were a kid, how many times did you relocate? How many divorces did your parents go through? How many adults uh, moved in and out of your house on a regular basis? Uh, just how so uncertain were your circumstances as a, as a kid? And that had quite a strong correlation with the dark triad. And so, as, of course, as I'm reading that, you know, I, I always sort of connect it with everything else I've read and my own personal experiences. And, you know, I'm wondering if as sort of families have dissolved in the U.S. over time, divorce has spiked. Uh, single parenthood has been on the rise for a long time. And, and I think about the way that I grew up and a lot of my friends from high school grew up. 
could the dark triad sort of be on the rise uh, as a result of sort of family instability in childhood? And I'm wondering what you think about that. And sort of I based have on felt your that for three decades. Years on Love Line. I, uh, there's, there's no, there's mm-hmm. no doubt, no doubt in my mind. There's absolutely categorically no doubt in my mind. Um, what we were seeing from in, in sort of the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, we had a lot of overt childhood trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, abandonment. And that was creating the narcissism and the borderline stuff. But the the destruction of the family makes perfect sense for me that would create the dark triad kind of features. And interestingly, um, I, I'm just noticing, I, I've done some of the dark triad screening instruments with people here and there. And, and I've noticed that people with sort of borderline qualities don't have those i thought they might have them. they don't have them it's a different thing uh, which is kind of interesting mm. uh they they have the, some of the narcissism but they're not machiavellian they're not they're not psychopathic they're, they're in their own stuff that, that they're trying to contend with and uh, they often feel bad about what they're doing and they're exquisitely sensitive to other people as opposed to shut off shut down to the people and yet the instability mm. of the family system and the lack of ability to trust is really underlying it that 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 the safety of the family system and the the stable quality relationships with the adult over time, that has a massive, massive impact on child development. It just does. And uh, yeah, yeah, we got to do something a, about that. There's no doubt about it. What? Well, there's a researcher uh, named uh, Jean Twenge, a social psychologist. Uh, she and uh, Keith Campbell, another psychologist, they They've documented how narcissism has been on the rise among college students. I think they tracked something like from the 1970s until you know the mid 2000s or something, and basically finds a consistent yeah. increase across time, across time points uh, among that cohort of college yeah. students. Um, yeah. And one thing that I was wondering, you know, so that's narcissism, but what about these other two personality constructs? And also, I mean, those are students. Yeah. I mean, so so from a you know from a class perspective college students are much more likely to come from two parent families, especially people who go to like really fancy mm-hmm. colleges. Um, but, but even in mm-hmm. general, uh, only a lot of people don't know this, but only about a third of Americans, uh, graduate from college. That's sort it's sort of an unusual thing. Most Americans don't go to college. They don't graduate from college. Uh, and so the people who do tend to come from more stable, more middle-class or upper middle-class backgrounds. I'm wondering though, about like working class people, who tend to experience more instability in their early lives, the people who don't have as much money and, and sort of as much sort of security in their, in their lives, whether people who grew up in those circumstances, you know, if, if that sort of dark triad has increased among them across time, and, and this could be why. I, I you know, think, sort of unfortunately, like more lower income communities. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're seeing that kind of, the, you're, I mean, you're seeing it, you're observing it. Yeah, Gene, Gene had some unusual ideas about gene twinge about acquired narcissism and things like that That's, no uh, it, it's yeah. all but what i find interesting what i find interesting though is i think the dark triad can be managed i mean you your own life is an example of this because you sort of had those qualities and and they can be qualities that are sort of aren't as deep as the profound injury of childhood trauma they're they're sort of survival strategies that you get into yeah. in these situations and, and and you and if you think about them and if you provided the right environment they can settle down rather nicely and so that's I what it so. me now is this, this opportunity for help there yeah i mean i think there you, there's there could be a distinction made i mean i agree that that and there's a lot of research that that supports this that these are sort of survival strategies the sort of short-term thinking uh, you know, if you're if you're uncertain about what's going to happen tomorrow, you may act more selfishly today, uh, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. so, you know, if there, there could be a sort of dispositional uh, dark triad where you sort of feel these feelings of manipulation or self-centeredness or whatever, but then there's the behavioral component of whether or not you actually act on it. Um, there's a there's a neuroscientist, uh, James Fallon, who you might have heard this story, but he discovered that he himself is a psychopath based on brain scans. And he reflected on sort of the way that he grew up and sort of the ways that he would manipulate his friends and sort of uh, treat people badly and act in very self-interested ways. But he also had um, very loving parents and a good home environment, and they sort of instilled good values in him. So even though he felt these things and sometimes kind of acted on them in playful ways, he directed some of that energy towards his career into being a successful neuroscientist. 
And, you know, I, I, when I look at my own life, I can see some of that as well, that, you know, when I joined the military, a lot of those young guys maybe did have some amount of these kinds of traits, you know, guys who join the military tend to tend to be sort of more adventurous and, you know, whatever. And so the military created this structure around them and gave them goals, short term and long term goals and told them what they were supposed to do every day and gave them a direction. And I think uh, there are a lot of young guys who may score highly on these traits who can be directed in a, in a, in a direction that's more yeah. positive rather than sort of detrimental and harmful to those around them. So James Fallon, I, I, I actually consider him kind of a friend. I've interviewed him many, many times. And uh, his, his story, though, you got to remember, he has genetic psychopathy. He has a missing piece on his functional MRI. <laughs> and and when, he'd start, when he started looking at himself, he was like, oh, my God. When he was a late adolescent, he became a religious fanatic for a while. Like he became this almost ascetic. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that that might have been a way to try to manage some of the impulses he was having. And then he did eventually, as you said, focus on his career and his academic uh, thing and was able to sort of figure out how to navigate socially. However, if you were close to him, family, close friend, he still treated you like shit. And in, when, he, yeah. when, he, when he discovered that he was a psychopath, his children and his wife went, oh, no, no, you're an asshole to us. You're terrible to us. And he was like, oh, okay. And then he went back in his genetic heritage and found that almost every other generation, a family member killed another family member going all the way back to, <laughs> listen, going all the way back to his relative, Lizzie Borden. Hmm. Okay. Well, isn't that interesting? That's, uh, so, that's, so there yeah. was a genetic, well, genetic, genetic thing with, and he, and he has a theory that there's different kinds of psychopaths and his was the kind that really acted out on family members. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, does he have kids? He may have to keep an eye, keep an eye on those kids then. He, he, uh, he did. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah been, right. Uh, well, and it, it, yeah, it, it ends up being, I forget how it's inherited. It wasn't first degree. It was often a second degree relative. If I remember, I thought I was saying it was every other generation. There was somebody, mm -hmm. um, but okay. whatever, whatever yeah. that is, you know, it shows up on fMRI. That's how he pulled out that he, you know, he thought he was going to put his fMRI in as a control. He turned out being a patient mm -hmm. and he was sitting in the control pile. You know, the story He was sitting in the control pile and he was going through the controls and, you know, un unmasking them. And he's like, Oh, here's a psychopath got mixed in the controls accidentally. And he unmasked it and it's his and he, he went into, actually yeah. went into denial about it for a while so hey it's a long it's a long story it's very very he has, he's got he's got uh ted talks out there you can you can see him on youtube all over the place uh, look him up james fallon N not jimmy fallon james yeah fallon. he was on weekly infusion with dr drew and he was also on ask dr drew remember with leanne tweeden I don't remember, but so I'm not we, surprised. We have both those podcasts with him. So yeah. Wanna... So if you want to look those up, so are are you yeah. are you focused on dark triad these days? Is that something you're sort of interested in? Or where, where's your research going now? What are you interested in? What's what preoccupies you? What are you thinking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's definitely uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about in in a lot of my writing and in my newsletter. Another one is the light triad, which is a more recent uh, personality construct from Scott Barry Kaufman. Uh, the light triad is, uh, so he, he um, uh, formulated sort of three personality uh, constellations here, or one constellation of, of three traits, uh, Kantianism, faith in humanity, and humanism. And this is basically sort of kindness, generosity, trust, like all of these things, like these sort of uh, positive and pro-social personality attributes. Um, and again, you know, in, in his research, he also measured, you know, sort of what's associated with these traits and finds that uh, childhood instability is negatively associated with the light triad. In other words, uh, the more unstable your childhood, the lower you score on these on these kind of traits, which I guess sort of makes sense based on what we talked about with the dark triad. And so this is also something that that's been concerning me as sort of as as more kids grow up in in sort of chaos and disorderly environments, are is this part of why we're seeing? And we actually are seeing this. I mean, there are very fascinating trends on the decline of trust in, in America. There was a very uh, sort of widespread uh, Pew poll a couple of years ago, uh, sort of comparing and contrasting um, sort of levels of trust in age groups. And for Americans over 65, if you ask them, can most people be trusted? Can most Americans be trusted? People over 65, mm -hmm. it was something like 60 to 70 percent of senior citizens said, oh, yeah, most people can be trusted. And if you ask people under 30, uh, it drops to something like 28%. It's basically like they're, they're less than half as likely 
to say that most people can be trusted. And I wonder if this, you know, these trust issues in general might be related to sort of the the childhood instability, along with this sort of sharp rise in in dark triad traits, uh, which which we may be seeing yeah. as well. So I, yeah, I mean, all of those inability things been, inability you know, to trust. Mind. Yeah, I I see that yeah. c- clearly. That the trust is a core phenomenon in these constructs for sure. Um, if you don't mind, I want to yeah. just try to get to a couple of phone calls, see if anybody has questions for you. Um, this is Kenny. Very quickly, I want to see if there's anything that comes up for, for you before I let you go. Uh, Kenny, sure. is n- try him again. Uh, Kenny Goss, Kenny. Let's see if he comes up. Uh, it's interesting. I, I think people walk away from the phone when they're listening on a Clubhouse sometimes, and then I pull them up all of a sudden, and they're not ready. So I'm going to then try Stephen. Stephen, uh, see if you're uh, going to come up and ask Rob a question. Stephen can't come right now. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take a little break. Right. Is what, what's that, Susan? Let's bring Fred in because he's he's been waiting. Okay. Fr- Fred with Rob or let Rob go? It's up to you. Um, Rob, I, I was going to... I gonna, know Rob needs to go to bed. It's yeah, like I'm, I'm going to let Rob go. Yeah, because we, we've got Fred Stoller coming in and talk a little Norm MacDonald and... And I've sort of gotten, I've I've wrung out of you all I was looking for today. <laughs> so I appreciate you letting me subject you to my to my questioning. But but I I actually have a a really deep interest in evolutionary psychology. When, whenever I understand, try to understand what's correct or what's truth in a psychological process or or why we end up with certain sociological anthropological systems, I look to evolutionary psychology. I just do. That's where I feel like there. Yeah. The answers. Well, it, so, it helps me with um, uh, with two things. I mean, it helps me to understand sort of what I'm seeing, but it also helps me to predict what might happen next with with pretty good accuracy. I would say better right. than you know m- most other kinds of disciplines. I would say so. Yeah, very useful. And yeah, thanks thanks for having me, Andrew. And and before I let you go, are 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 you optimistic or pessimistic about what's going on in this country? I'm short-term pessimistic, long-term optimistic. So I'm hoping that sort of we'll get through the the bad times and the good times will will uh, will be sort of at the end of that that uh, dark enough. tunnel. I love it. Tell them the website again, Rob. Yeah, just follow me at uh, Rob K Henderson on Twitter, and my uh, website is robkhenderson.com. All right, my friend, get some sleep. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Doctor Drew. Thanks, Susan. Coming up. Fred Stoller, a little uh, Norm MacDonald uh, conversation when we return. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the blueberry we use in the studio right now, bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics, and once you try one, you will never go back, trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single serving easy pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy to pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, uses all natural flavors, gluten free, dairy free, caffeine free, non GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready to drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy. Or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H Y D R A L Y T E dot com slash D R D R E W. 
Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. I'm here with my daughter Paulina to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right. No kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st. Uh, pre-order. No, no, you don't need to pre-order. You can get the book. It's available as of yesterday. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it, uh, signed copies at, uh, what is that website, Premier, Susan? Premier, Premier Collectibles. Collectibles.com slash awkward. Premier, Premier Collectibles. Signed, signed one. Susan will put that up. They can the actually, they can get the link if they just go to drdrew.com slash awkward Dr. and it has the link right there. Yeah. Ah, Believe there me, go. we've told everybody. I think. I think they all heard it. All right, it's it's out there. We've got it. We like it. We're happy with how it turned out. And we need Paulina, a new, new commercial when she Yes, we do. She's coming back next week. We're going to be everywhere talking about <laughs> yeah. it. So we're all over the place. Um, so let's bring in uh, my friend and uh, actor, Fred Stoller, comedian, stand-up. Susan was going through Fred's pedigree yesterday and going, oh, my God, Fred's been in everything, right? He has had a charmed life. He has been in everything. And in fact, he wrote a book like about that. Uh, wait, I, you think guys didn't put the title here? here. Wait, wait, what's the name of the book? It's like, Fred, come on in here. The book is called... Uh-oh. That's, uh -oh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's my cat. That's Fred's cat. Hi, kitty. Uh, this is hysterical. This is really funny. Yes. What's it called again? From Love Life. Maybe we'll have you back. Maybe we'll have you back. That's what it is. That's it. the book of Fred's uh, experiences which, as which I, a as a guest actor. Which didn't happen yes. on Love Line. That's yes, star. traumatized being here. Because when I did Love Line. What happened? They go, they said, can't you be more like Nick Swartzen? They were so disappointed. They like that kind of humor. And I'm a little stressed because Susan was going, That'll be the funny part of the show, which how do you follow Rob Henderson? He's very funny. I was cracking up. And um, <laughs> I, yeah, it's like a, I was having anxiety because I'm not feeling funny. I'm not doing that, you know, so I, I, you, I'd like to talk, but I can't be like Nick Swanson. Hey, hey and ooh, I don't know. I know they love that on Love Line. Nick Swanson. I, I I did not anticipate you being that way, so you can feel less anxious. I wanted to talk to you about right. your friend Norm uh, and uh, about how you both kindly uh, allow me, if you remember this, I visited you at the Ice House when you were touring with Norm. And that was, yes. uh, I, I'd met Norm many times over the years. I played actually baseball with him a couple of times at these sort of right. celebrity Dodger games. And but the only time I really spent any time with him was in that green room, that little crazy green room at the ice house here in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoyed both of your stand up that night. I thought you complimented each other really interestingly. And and Norm told a, a, a joke that night that stayed with me to this day where he gets out there and he's one of the first things he said, he goes, God, I love Love Bill Cosby. I love everything about Bill Cosby. The Bill, I, I fashion my life after Bill Cosby. I love everything about that guy except his humor. <laughs> so, oh, I thought that was such a that was biggest, such a great joke. But someone said the biggest problem was the hypocrisy. That was the thing you can't get over. Someone said that, 
and he goes, what about the race? Yeah, he had that but, too. Um, You're right. Yes. That's right. He, he goes on to say, right. yeah, he goes on. Yes, he when went he on to say, the thing I can't stand you're about Bill Cosby is he's a hypocrite. It's hypocrisy. And Norm would just say, what about the raping? That, that, that's not a part that bothers yes. you, too. <laughs> that's very you know, funny. I, um, so. It's, um, you know, uh, this woman, Tina, I think you met her. She was at, the, at a bar we went to once with Fred. And she, a lot of people called or texted thanking me for when, uh, well, for coming to that show you went to, or for when they, um, I brought Norm by, and he was larger than life. And um, so I can't, re I'm not really processing this because, you know, I didn't know the extent that he was sick. And then, and I I'm still in the days because, um, then two days later, or we, on the Emmys, I had to rewind the in memoriam because it still doesn't feel right. Because, you know, anytime, mm. you know, you brought him by, he's just on and busting balls. And and I knew I met him the first time he came to the Hollywood Improv in 1989. He was shy and skinny and nervous being at the Hollywood Improv and... So, yeah, we hung out a lot. I don't mean just close to a year I opened for him, but but he was, yeah, I'm taking this differently than other people I lost because he went, well, not that to compare him to my mother, but my mother didn't crack me up like Norm did, but just there was nothing casual about both of them. They were horses. And again, it's, I didn't see it coming and uh so yeah it's just it's it's it was a uh fraught relationship which makes it part of the process because um right but hey fred yes, can you move I a little mean, closer to your mic the the sure fred look yes, closer to the mic the, your sound better? is a little weird and muffled right now is way better, better? I don't know what happened. uh okay. we were good it sounded it, better earlier but... yeah you're good um yeah uh, you guys had a cantankerous you guys kind of had a cantankerous relationship yes well it was bust on a lot of busting balls which but that's norm and uh you know people know the story he stole my jacket and when you saw me on norm mcdonald live people reached out a lot saying he was giving you a hard time but you could see he cared that there was a history a connection mm -hmm. i mean i've had people stop me on the street saying, I know there was a connection. So maybe there was something about us, some chemistry where you could tell when I was on this podcast, I did a sitcom three times, that there was a, it was, uh, it was a type of thing though, even though when he was being most annoying, it was annoying, but I was still having a great time. And that's him, that's just <laughs> ridiculous, beyond ridiculous. But it was, um, that's, that's the way true. he communicated. He's you know, he, that's the way he communicated. And uh, it yeah. wasn't, yeah. it wasn't just like casual conversations. It was big, big, like, you know, hanging out. And we, when we played tennis, we'd have to play for three or four hours. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't leave. You couldn't just hang out with him. When I opened for him, part of the deal was hanging out all night long after this set till he fell asleep and just being ridiculous. So I, I'm very sad. <laughs> being ridiculous. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, and, and no, it was just because it was, it was ridiculous. Big, he would do that. But he was hysterical and genius. And it was, it was just the experience I've had since 1989. He would just like show up sometimes at my door, and sometimes I hadn't seen him for months, sometimes years, leaving off like a best friend. What the fuck are you doing, Freddie? You got the, the fuck is this guy? And and just, yeah. So it's hard, it's hard to... Well, it's interesting. Same thing with my mother. Yeah. Well, my mother, what, what like, about I your think mother? my sister, I don't know if my, my sister stuck through Rob Henderson. She was texting me going, I'm confused. Where are you? No, I was... Uh, but... When my mother died in July, we were there, and that was a fraught relationship, but we didn't believe she was gone, because Pearl was Pearl, like Norm was Norm. It was just, 
And it, it, it was hard to believe someone like that was not here, even though my mother was 93 and right. not doing well. So, so, so isn't that to believe. interesting? Yeah. Yes. We, we as humans, Am I we, being we, sort of like Nick we, the, No, I mean, you're not being Nick Swartzen. Thank God. Thank God. Well, Thank God. Not that I don't love Nick. Nick Bobby, they were positive that Nick Swartzen would be tomorrow when there was applauding. And I was trying to be love on it, but all right. They were applauding. Stop. Driving, running that was, you're talking about 12 years that. ago, by so, the way. Right. So, I'm so. Sorry, I won't interrupt. But, so. So the humans do this strange thing, which is we internalize pieces of each other. And when somebody is a big person or an important person in our life, it, it, we our brain doesn't really let go of that person. We we keep a piece of it inside. In fact, we often maybe that, that's one that of the reasons intentional of norm. Is that uh, intentional no. people like norm to be no. No, 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 no. It's just what happens. I, what's interesting to me between you and Norm is when you describe him showing up in 1989 at the improv, I feel like you were describing yourself. So to me, well, he probably he, yeah. was somewhat holding up a, a mirror to you a little bit, which is a very powerful thing to have happen. Well, at first he was, he was, he was petrified being at the Hollywood improv, this seminal, you know, place. And he wasn't established. He was a Norm. And then he did SNL and we'd hang out, we'd play, we'd play tennis for hours, we'd see movies all night long, we'd play games and fight. I don't remember the games. Like I, I introduced him to one no borns, talk about French, and just fighting and trivia games. And and um, but one thing interesting is uh so many people who were saw us on the tour together reached out. One uh radio person in Portland. And she kept in touch with him and said, you know, oh, thanks for bringing Fred by. I didn't know how funny. And Norm goes, yeah, Fred's a good guy. He's shy. He's like me. He's, I'm a shy guy. But you wouldn't know it. I, someone said something interesting about me, a friend, that I never learned how to overcompensate for whatever pathology with my mother or just being skinny and Norm was skinny. So Norm became the Norm persona. Hey, hey, look at this guy. Look at this fucker over here. So he was really shy and maybe he saw myself in him and didn't like stuff he saw or related and so but we had it's still yeah it was still a bond and one of those things yeah but does that make any sense and tell me something tell me something about yeah it makes sense uh, i i I don't understand why no one knew about his illness. And even to this day, we still don't know what we're talking about here, except that he had some sort, I keep hearing the word leukemia. And if you had leukemia for 10 years, that means something called no, CML, yeah, yeah. chronic chronic lymphocytic well, the or chronic myelogenous leukemia. Yeah, and, and the well, fact, the and, and people don't typically, go ahead. Sorry, well, you're a doctor, you know better than me, how long someone, has something. For example, did you know comedian actor Taylor Negron? Are my eyes in the right place? Because when I look at me, I'm looking. Does it matter? I'm, I'm not looking directly. Here comes but Susan. Did you know Taylor Negron? Uh, that's just. Uh, no. Um, okay. yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Taylor Negron was, was fighting cancer eyes on and off for years. The sound but, that's all messed up. Uh, or, um, sorry. Your mic go out or something? Well, we're going with it. Go ahead, Frank. Is my mic out. Should I look on the uh, should I look on system preferences? I don't know. Uh, input, if, input. Oh, built in. Yeah, Maybe input. I'm doing Bluetooth. Let me do. Is this better? Built in mic. I click no. that on. You, yeah, you Let want the, it's the same. Is, is this better? Yeah, click on the uh, select the built in mic and then click apply. Okay, input. I uh, just put that in. How's it sounding? It doesn't uh, actually sound any different. And, hmm, okay, just raise the yeah. level. What happened to you? Uh, input. Um, sorry. Did you Is have another mic attached? To... No, I usually just do <laughs> MacBook Pro microphone. I Speak. put that. Um, sorry, um, you're not hearing me at all? Or Hello? That's so weird. 
Uh, Bluetooth, not Bluetooth. Okay, can the people at home hear me? Is anyone hearing this? You know what? what? You know what? The comment? Bluetooth. Yes. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, in, it's hard to hear. I put in. I put in. Um. Oh, well, this sucks. All that prep and. Um, is anything being heard? Hmm. Yes. Yeah. We, like, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Just a little. So echoey, fuzzy. what was? Okay. Sorry. What was the question? Oh, how nine years? How so? Nine years just speculating leukemia. Uh, Drew. Well, that's what the what I keep hearing. That's what I keep hearing. Um, well, you know what's interesting when we would I, tour. I, can you hear me again? I'm sorry. Yep. Can yeah, yeah. You? I'm hearing you. Well, we would continue. Yep, please. Photograph people would meet us at the wherever we stop with all these things from Norm to sign once or twice me, and my friend who works at TMZ said that. Um, People at the airlines get paid to tip off these, not autograph people, but people sell them. So you would think if someone was mm -hmm. fighting something as famous, sort of famous as Norm is, that it would have leaked. So I'm curious how that works. Uh, you would think so. Yeah, the whole thing is very bizarre to me. And the whole, everything around it's, his death is not fitting together for me. Yeah, because you let me, would let me, think, I mean, he was, um, if you have leukemia, do you get chemo? Is that different? Um, it's, it's, it's different. I mean, it, it can progress to something where you need that. Let's see. Because the uh, only, the only clue, the only clue we had, all of us had was, um, that his face looked puffy and some was going, maybe he was on, um, you know, uh, what were you saying? Technology well, corticosteroids can be part of that Can be part of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, so with with CLL, it, it does what's called a blast crisis. It sort of blasts off at the end and you can get into a, a year or two of really, really bad illness. But d do we know that that happened? Did, you know, did that happen to him? Did he have a uh, year of struggle or was he struggling by himself or what happened? I, I It's so hard. You to know, know, he was very, very private. Actually, he never liked Tignataro or people. He called it pity comedy. People that... Um, you know, he didn't like those confessional comedians that talk about molestation or, um, uh, you know, um, cancer or confessional. So he was a man's man. So Tig, so, T Tig, who who talked about her breast cancer very openly, and was yes. and was applauded for that. He he took exception to that. Well, I shouldn't start a thing right now, but he did have some tweets. I I'm an asshole because I don't know if he named her. But he didn't like he he labeled something pity comedy where where he he not, but forget Tignataro, um nice person he he never talked about anything personal in his act his whole career like angst or his background a, a former wife his son any relationships any neurosis and so mm -hmm. that was norm. Norm didn't really talk about painful things. Uh, if you remember, and I think that hysterical. that may be why, and that that sort of makes sense why we're having difficulty understanding or figuring out what happened to him, right? Yes, yes, he was very private. You know, again, he never, you know, talked about yes, um, any psychological angst. You know, he talked about things like I don't like that, you know, or. Uh, you know, I'm from a long line of death, you know, but not really, you didn't really know anything about his past or people in his life or anything. Yes. You know, he, he, he came. Yeah, I'm just looking from, to see uh, if there are any, and, and I, I'm just looking to see if there's any, uh, you know, recent changes in the prognosis for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It's, it's essentially a 10 year illness and then things get bad. So he's right on. Oh, so right he's a ten-year illness. Unfortunately. So then I guess he had leukemia. Yeah, like I thought. I thought. I thought they were doing better with it these days, but. Um, well, isn't it, it that like you it. only? I, I thought they, I think Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had it, and so did the guy from Dexter. He has. He had, lymph he had lymphoma. lymphoma. He had lymphoma. I thought you I understand what was 
I thought you get better from leukemia if you have the um, what's it called? Not the transplant. What's it called? The um, chemo. Well, bone marrow right? trans. That's that's AML. That's bone acute marrow. myelogenous leukemia. Yeah, that's AML, acute myelogenous leukemia, and and those do do well with bone marrow transplants. I I don't know on CLL and CML. I, I I just what I'm scanning on the internet. It says it's you know about ten years still. Well, so that's why I'm also illness, in shock. Maybe, yeah. that, that's why I'm also in shock because yeah, I I in all of a sudden I was getting text after text after so many phone calls and condolences and um, yeah, so I'm just as in shock. And, uh, and did he because, have a service? Did he have? Did he have a service or a funeral? You know, not that I know of. I mean, another. Yeah. Not, I would call he was only a peripheral friend, and after Willie Garson just died of cancer, and he was at he was very upbeat, and he's having a service I think tomorrow, and it's pretty quick. So, I'm suspecting Norm wanted that, but, something very, very, very private. I don't know. It's very private. Yeah, and, and but for someone like you. I, I get that, and but for someone like you who knew him so well, it would help you to go to some sort of closure or some sort of service. That's one of the reasons people do that kind of thing is to get the ability to kind of let it in to really accept what has happened. It's hard, it's super hard. It, it is it, again. I'm still, and because they're memorializing him so much with all these awesome clips, I'm watching them. And I still hear his voice. It's such a vivid voice in my head hey freddie or this mm -hmm. like i you know I, he was almost like like a parent you want to please because he saw me on uh doug benson where you get stoned and he loved it and and i'd be a thing send me the link like your friend howard lapidus he wanted me to send a link he had a podcast and i i didn't because i think i called i said he's a ball buster or it could be a bully but he, <laughs> i could picture him watching it's mm -hmm. like uh, Friday, uh, why are you bad? That's not how I sound. Or so yeah, it's almost like a parent because it would, get, you know, Norm had this legion of fans that would get back to him, and like we did a podcast, me and you, years ago, where I recounted some of the funny stories of opening for him, where you know he forgot his pants, and I had to help him get pants, and that became a YouTube clip, and. So some people would always send them, look, Freddie's talking about you. So even now, I I feel Norm is watching. Mm. You know? Mm. Even, you know, so yeah. it's, it is like a parent in a way because, you know, it was this guy that, you know, you know things will get back to him, but you, and I would like when he would like something, you know, I did and he cracked up, so... Yeah, and it's a lot of you want to please him. He had this thing where, you know, I turned him up. We'd always like fight what movie, like he, you know, he had said something interesting, which I'm hearing a lot about people with anxiety, where he got to a point where he only wanted to watch movies he already saw. I think we don't want the anxiety, mm -hmm. it might not be good. You want the comfort, you know this is gonna be good, and uh there's no surprise. So he he got to a point. Right. So I always wanted to turn him on to a movie he never saw. He he always insisted, and he'd get mad because I didn't. I was I wasn't a big John Hughes fan, and he you're not liking the movie. He loved it, the Thanksgiving one with John Candy and Steve Martin. So it would always be. But then I remember I I was very proud that I turned him on to a movie. Uh, they, some came running with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and Shirley MacLaine. You're so happy when he likes it. So, yeah. But did you ever hear that about anxiety well, where we want the comfort of something we already saw? You read the book, you read a lot, and he would watch yeah, the same movie. Yeah. And, and I actually, I actually, Fred had not heard that, but as somebody with generally, I could relate to it. It's like, I understand that you don't want the tension building and the surprise of a, of a narrative. You like the film and the experience and the characters. You want to spend time with them again, but you don't want to deal the, the, the comfort you know what's going to happen. Well, it's, yeah, it could be like when you get to a certain age, it's hard to make new friends. So it's sort of like, you just want, it's like a comfort and this is, there's yeah, no surprise. Yeah. And, um, I get yeah. it. 
Well, Fred, uh, but, uh, he he will be with us all for a long time to come. Uh, and I knew it was something rather profound for you because you had a very long and rich and interesting relationship together. And, and uh, he is gone. I'm sorry to say that to you, my friend. He is not here, even though it feels like he is it's not so just to you, but to all of us. You've, you've got him in your head. We all, every time we go past YouTube, there's another Norm video. It feels like he's always exactly. around. And the fact yeah. that abruptness... And um, yeah, it's only 61. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, it just, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. yes, we had a great time at the <laughs> Ice House. And you you had to go, but then we hung out at a place next door with Fraser and my friend who came to see the show. <coughs> and uh, yeah, we hung out right next to the Ice House. And uh, there was nothing casual about Norm. You, you had to hang out and hang out and hang out, you know. So we hung out a lot. And um, hang out in a big way. Well, Fred, I, I want to thank you. People are saying, people are offering you their support on my chat stream here and how much oh, they love you, you and I, how much got, they, they feel sorry I, for you. I I appreciate it. Again, I, I thought Susan wanted me to, like, smack my head and, and make noises no. like Nick Swartzen. And, okay, okay. No. Nick Swartzen actually. But everybody knows you're thing. funny. I'm not saying anything I'm bad about him. I just I We're remember send you a blue when mic, I did though. Love Line. <laughs> I yeah, gotta, send yeah, you a Yeti. I'm, We're gonna send you that. a Yeti. You're gonna. I think Norm's messing with your sound, so you can get a free mic out of me. Uh, well, when, when we, when we, <laughs> the ghost is coming through the electronics today. Oh, he's um, well. he uh, yeah no no no. There's gonna be. Dreams. I, I've been having a lot of dreams with my mother and father, and my father died for a yeah. few years ago. So, and by the way, your dad's your dad's artwork is unbelievable. You describe your dad as sort of PTSD and so quiet, and oh my god, he was like a he should have been a professional cartoonist. Well, my sister described him. He was like a mad scientist who went in went in the uh, garage, and that's that's how he escaped. He just. Uh, sculptured and uh in retirement and did all that stuff mm. and mm. uh i Very apologize for the bad mic and uh uh is dinner still on or is susan mad at me yeah no dinner's on and blue mic's on its way okay. and uh <laughs> all right. and uh all right and fred i'll see you soon i'm sorry about pearl i'm sorry about norm uh but we're all here for you okay man hey thank you so much um and uh I always defend you and, you know, I'm just kidding. I get, asked, I get asked a lot of questions about, about Norm and you. Mm, people I know, weird? know you. No, yeah, so well, funny. are you a real doctor? Yes. Mm. You know. No, you, that's funny. You know, so, so when you, when you I, pass, I, they think you you're like Dr. Joy, calling. they think you're Dr. Joyce Brothers. I mean, it's like uh. Dr. Phil. <laughs> You Super know, crazy. Super I, crazy. Do you, you get that a lot Not too? Not my though, jam. Right? They, yeah, they, people they, don't they, understand they don't, that I. I doctor yeah, means I, medical. I, I mean, in, you're not like. Right. I'm, I, and I'm not a psychiatrist. Like, I'm an internist that worked in a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. But anyway, people don't understand those things. Right. So I, I, I always Thank explain you. it by saying I was going to. I explain it now by saying I was going to be a cardiologist, but I started moonlighting a psychiatric hospital, and that's where my interest sort of uh, blossomed. So, uh, okay, right. no, uh, thank you, my friend. Uh, I'm going to let you go. All right, all right, buddy. Thank Thanks you. so much. Yeah, let's do it again. Oh. Maybe we should have done right, it in person. The mic. I'll come <laughs> bring him in here. In we'll bring him in. All right. Okay, you and also, um, are we going? Okay, right, love you. you. Um, so. And I want um, to take some calls too. I'm going to get him a on. World of Warcraft Yeti. Okay, good. Yeah, we have, we have one that they were going to send. Um, <laughs> it has right. like, it's cool. It's black and it's got gold trim. I mean, you can't really tell it has World of Warcraft on it, but he'll like it. All right, let me try to get some calls up. Uh, Kenny, who I, I called up here earlier to the platform. Again, you're going to be streamed on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, uh, Facebook, and uh, everywhere else that we could possibly stream out. Uh, well, once again... Kenny's not coming up, so I'm going to go to Josh. Josh, what's going on? Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey, what's up? Not much. I uh, really enjoyed both of those interviews. Um, Fred actually has a lot of wisdom, and I was oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. reflecting on just his 
life wisdom, right. <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, my question is about the dark triad. Mm. Um, I wanted to, I had two questions. One, I wanted you to talk more about psychopathy. Mm -hmm. And the second question I had was, is borderline personality disorder sort of the female equivalent of narcissism? And is that why it doesn't show up uh, sort of in the psychopathy realm? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put you uh, back in the room because that's a very complicated question you're asking, and I'm going to try to do it justice. So uh, the dark triad is narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. Uh, as Rob and I were discussing, that's more than anything a, uh, a, ex a coping strategy. I'm not sure, other than the narcissism, which can become a deep personality trait, these aren't really personality traits per se, so much as ways of navigating in the world that may be associated with narcissism or psychopathy. People argue about psychopathy and sociopathy, right? For me, sociopathy is a condition where people are narcissistic. It's a narcissistic disorder where they lack empathy, though not as bad as true narcissists. They can have a fair bit of empathy. They just don't care in certain circumstances. And p other people, they perceive to be in their life just to serve their needs and to make them happy. Whatever the sociopath needs, that's what other people are there to serve. For narcissists, it's a little more draconian. Like you may, they just, they, 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 they need you to keep them pumped up but they don't manipulate you. And if you don't cooperate with them, they just cast you out. It's a little different than a sociopath who will manipulate and entertain and get what they need from you. Different. People argue whether psychopathy and sociopathy are related or even the same thing. There are psychopathy screening tests that a lot of people use that for me, for my sort of money seem to be actually screened for sociopathy. So I, the way I look at it, sociopathy is a DSM-5 diagnosis. There are criteria for it psychopathy is a genetic neurobiological disorder you can watch james fallon's interviews and youtube uh, ted ted talks and stuff we were talking about how you can see the functional mri deficiencies in the actual psychopath psychopaths don't have emotions they don't understand emotions they learn to navigate and use the what they see in other people as emotions and to understand what they are as an intellectual concept they don't feel emotions and so when they express an emotion it's a manipulation typically and so psychopaths are more dangerous because other people don't really exist for them and if a psychopath was traumatized in childhood they can be a real horror borderline there can be male and female borderlines, and people, are, are, it's more on the female uh, spectrum. It probably is not the female manifestation of, and by female, I mean XX chromosome. Female, we're not talking about gender, we're talking about human female biology. That the female, uh, the borderline is probably the, the, the tendency for females to manifest sociopathy. So the, the sociopathy, per se, much more common in men borderline much more common in women and for some reason that i don't know that anybody fully understands when people have romantic attractions sociopaths and borderlines tend to go together in treatment programs whenever you have sociopaths and borderlines together you have to keep them separated because they always do things that are not conducive to their recovery together so and borderline disorder is far it's really quite different than um either psychopathy or narcissism. It's a narcissistic disorder in the sense that these people are in pain at the self-preoccupation. I mean, I, I have the opinion that pain generally makes people self-preoccupied. So if you're walking around with a narcissistic injury, of course you're going to be focused on yourself. You are in pain. Uh, what you do with that pain is sort of the personality manifestation. And borderlines are very attuned to other people's stuff, and they use something called projective identification. That is to say... They like it's I the way I get people to understand it, it's a tough thing to understand. But do you know you when you walk in a room when a baby's crying and the baby wants you to change their diaper or or uh, feed them, the feeling you get when that baby is screaming and crying, that's a kind of a projective identification in my mind. And borderlines yes, I know essentially what that's project like. 
<laughs> why why do you say that caleb what happened because i have a new baby oh with the <laughs> baby only two with months the old. baby with <laughs> yeah. the baby so you know i thought you were talking about somebody in your family or something but yeah so 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 yeah so you know that feeling right how do you describe that feeling it's like i gotta do something i gotta i gotta make this stop right i literally have to like caleb? if we were doing the show right now and if he was crying in the other room yeah. i would be in the other room i, I i'd have to go take care of him yeah. because i, I you I don't know to, where that comes it, from. My it, priorities are completely changed. <laughs> well, there's there's our natural instinct to nurture and care for the dependent child, and that's just something that comes on to most of us, nearly all of us. Uh, but but it's also that that feeling of I, I got to make that crying stop and meet the needs of that child. Oh, it's a cute picture. That's him, by the way. Hey, look at that. He's growing. Cute. Congratulations. <laughs> huge. But he but he'll going. I'm sure throw some huge tantrums that get under your skin, you know, and get you feeling like, I, 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 I what's up? What is that? I got to make it stop. And that's sort of, that's sort of uh, a, a very primitive version of projective identification. And so the, what, what happens with the borderline folks is they have a lot of feelings that they disavow, a lot of awful feelings that they don't like. And they literally either, either project them into the other person and get you to feel those feelings or accuse you of those feelings. Anyways, they, they sort of push everything off themselves, literally into other people and then they manipulate the other people as a way of regulating their emotions. That's sort of that's sort of the way to think about it. It's very it's a very challenging thing to understand, but uh, you get a feel for it uh, if you've been around it. So uh, thank you for that question, Josh. Very good question. Uh, and Kenny, I'm sorry you did not. I've tried to pull it up there multiple times. You didn't come to the the uh, to the podium. Uh, I want to thank uh, those of you at Clubhouse for sticking around and sitting through our little conversation here. But uh, I think Rob Henderson is so interesting. I could talk to him all day. It's robkhenderson.com. Twitter at Rob K. Henderness, Henderson, H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Uh, and then Fred's stuff. I forgot to get Fred to tell us his, uh, let me see if I've got it here in this email you sent me. Uh, Twitter is Fred underscore Stoller. Is that right, uh, Caleb? Yes, that's it looks correct. looks like Fred underscore Stoller. Yeah, S-T-O-L-L-E-R. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, and, uh, thank you, Caleb, for producing today's show. And thank you to Susan for, uh, sitting behind the mic here with me. And, uh, I don't think there's much else, uh, I want to get into today. We will be around tomorrow for a dose, uh, at around two, three o'clock, two o'clock, it looks like to me, uh, Pacific time, a uh, little more, um, uh, with the restream. I've saw you guys there. I appreciate your attendance. And I appreciate all your comments, but I was en enraptured with my guest today. And thank you, uh, Freddie for, sharing your stories about Norm and your losses recently with him and your mom. And uh, we will see you all uh, hopefully tomorrow. Thank you so much for being here. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.